Hi, and welcome to the Days Gone podcast. I'm Claire Weaver, a screenwriter, author, and diehard Days Gone fan, and this podcast is a place to discuss the game in all its glory, share my opinions, both popular and unpopular, and listen to me fangirl over one of the best games ever made. There will be spoilers ahead, so continue at your own risk. Welcome to the Freak Show. Just a warning, every episode is going to feature spoilers, so if you're halfway through the game and you don't want to know how things pan out, don't listen to this podcast until you finish the game. I will spoil it for you, and I don't want to do that. I hate spoilers, so if you're playing right now, thank you for tuning in, but please leave and come back (laughs) when you finish the game. I really don't want to spoil this for anyone because the story is so compelling. And one of the things that kept me playing was to find the answer to the question, what has happened to Sarah? And that's what I want to talk about today. The first part of Days Gone is all about Deacon coming to terms with his grief. You get the impression that he had not grieved for Sarah, that he had suppressed his grief out of some sense of pride or air quotes masculinity. You know, he he didn't want to deal with it and it would manifest in him taking unnecessary risks. And this is really laid out in the first scene, in, in one of the early scenes with Boozer, when you're clearing the tunnel, the very first tunnel you have to go through and Deacon offers to walk point with the shotgun and he blows up the nest. Boozer makes some comment about how he has a death wish. And so that's really letting us know that his grief has become toxic within himself. And right off the bat, that's something that I thought was was really interesting for a character. So many times in video games, characters are quite straightforward. They're a hero or they're a villain or, you know, their trauma is a little simpler. Whereas this is, it has a layer of complexity to it that I found really compelling. And this continues with him trying to kind of deny it to Boozer that he's he's fine, everything's okay. It's like he can't let himself grieve because it in some way shows weakness. And if you're weak, then what good are you? And I think this comes from his past with the, with the MC and obviously in the army. And I don't know, maybe you, you kind of get a little hints about his relationship with his dad throughout. I don't think it was a bad relationship. I think maybe he got some of his values from his father in that regard. You don't want men to be seen as being weak. They should be strong, they should be providers and hunters and know how to take care of themselves. And it's also shown through the way he likes to take care of women. He is a protector. If he is vulnerable emotionally, then what good is he in his mind as a protector? So I think that's a really, really interesting place to start his story. And then, of course, you know, we see these little moments where he he does try to lean into his grief. He does try to process it. He's created a headstone for Sarah. He goes and puts flowers on her grave or, you know, on the headstone. And he so he does have these vulnerable moments where he is trying to work through his grief. And of course, what happens is Boozer gives him shit for it and like poo-poos the whole idea. Like this is a dumb thing and real men don't process grief. And it's just... It just, it hurts my heart for him because I want him to be able to grieve her and get through that and come out the other side. And when we first meet him, he's kind of like stuck in this this cycle that he can't break out of. One of the moments in the game that, that brought me to tears was the sequence with Ricky when they nearly have a moment. And I so wanted him to get with Ricky because she, she would be so good for him. And she sees it like it is. When she tells him it's better to light one candle than curse the darkness. Man, that had me bawling. That was such a fucking good moment because that's what he needed to hear. That's what he needs to do. But then he realizes that Sarah might have survived. And it's like, whoa, okay, so all of this time, me as a player, I've been yearning for Deacon to allow himself to grieve and come through it. And now something's telling him, oh, wait, no, don't grieve. In fact, even more don't grieve. Like, like turn up the, the suppression of your grief, suppress your grief even further. Lean into the hope that Sarah is still alive. It's sad because obviously, narratively, we want Sarah to be alive. And and you know, you kind of figure that she's going to be alive. Otherwise, that whole storyline would be for naught. We're aware it's a narrative game. We know how stories work. But as a person, a character, you know, as a person, it's like, I just want him to be able to get through it. And here's another thing telling him, no, no, stamp the brakes. Don't allow yourself to grieve because now you're going to have false hope that she's alive. It's not just don't grieve because it'll make you weak. It's here's some hope that she might still be alive. And you know the, the chances, the fucking chances she's alive, slim to none. 
really honestly slim to none. This is, and I love Sarah, this is nothing against Sarah, but this is a girl who didn't even know how to fire a gun. And you're telling me that she survived out of all of these people, she survived the zombie apocalypse? Not a chance. It's just absolutely crazy to think that. And especially because there are, I think, mentions of two different camps that she was at that were overrun by freakers. Like, how? She, there's no way she would have got out. I mean, okay, so we know she, she did get out and she is alive. How she got into the militia camp is a little unclear. We'll get to that in another discussion. So Deacon sets out to find her, and it actually doesn't take too long in the game before you do find her. I was, I was quite surprised at how quickly that happened. But then, of course, you realise that the game still has so much more going on. There are so many more missions to do, and so much more story that happens. But initially, I was like, oh, whoa, here she is, we found her. As soon as they mentioned the Wizard Island Witch, I was like, bingo, that's going to be her. We meet her, and it happens. They're reunited. Of course, everyone's wondering, is this going to be a happy, movie romantic moment I think we're all or most of us were expecting that I was kind of on the fence I was like I don't know how they're going to pull that off it doesn't seem to fit with this world I think people who were expecting a happy ending perhaps weren't paying attention to how grim and cruel this world is but anyway we have that moment and she turns and she looks at him and they lock eyes and she realises that he's alive and he obviously realises realize she's alive and they don't click it's kind of frosty. They they do have a kiss in that first scene, but it very quickly becomes awkward and she's sort of standoffish and, and he's kind of not helping matters. A lot of people didn't like that scene because they they felt they deserved a happy romantic moment. But you know what? This world is fucking cruel. And also they're married. Like anyone who's been married, you know what I'm talking about when I say you have those times when you're just, you're not on each other's wavelength. You just, you're not vibing. You're out of sync with each other. And that's what's happening in this moment times 10,000, times a million, because hello, zombie apocalypse. They haven't seen each other in two years. Deacon has been through hell and high water. He's almost been killed a million times. You know, he's been fighting freakers. There's that beautiful speech he gives about how he's been out in the ship so close to the freakers that he can smell the rotting flesh stuck between their teeth. And she's been through some shit too. I mean, she, her face looks all kind of beat up and like, she's got scars, she can handle a gun now, and so she's been through some shit. We don't know exactly what happened to her, but we can only imagine. They both have PTSD, they both have trauma, they're both survivors, and they haven't seen each other in two years, and they both thought the other person was dead. You don't just lock eyes with someone and be like, great, everything's fine. That takes time to process. And that's the fucking coolest thing about this game, is that we take that time to process all of those emotions. The rest of the game is about them coming back together. It's about them working through their grief and finding a way to resync with each other, to get back in love. They still obviously love each other, but it's become a memory of love. It's become the kind of love you have for someone who's deceased. It's not an active love. It's not a passion. It's not, I mean... <laughs> I was going to say it's not lust. If you think about it, these people probably stink. You know, there are no showers in this world. <laughs> so they're just the physical attraction, you know, they're probably... I know in the game they, they look slim but muscular. Like, Deacon's really toned. And Sarah, she has, like, she's, like, she has strength to her. But if you think about the reality of what it would be like living in that kind of world, everyone would be so scrawny. You would have almost no muscle because you'd be starving half the time. You'd be malnourished. Plus, they're going to smell. In terms of just physical attraction, that's going to be a little bump for them. They don't look like the people they used to look. And part of a relationship is based on looks. It's the way we work. Obviously, marriage and love is deeper than that, but it's that's still a component of it. And also just the stress and the pressure they're under. Romance and sex is not going to be something that you think of pretty often. I, I wouldn't imagine like a post-apocalyptic time you're fighting for your life constantly. I mean, obviously, they do take the opportunity to sleep together, but it's not an immediate thing. It takes time to get there. That's really my whole point about the beauty of the story is that it takes time. It takes time for Deacon to come to terms with his grief. It takes time for him to realize that he can embrace hope. And then when he finds Sarah, it takes him and it takes her time to reconnect. 
and to find what they had before because they both become different people. They still love each other, but Sarah's not the same person she was before and Deacon's not the same person he was before. That's what I love about this game is that it feels real. These feel like real characters going through a real emotional journey. And it's crazy heightened, of course, because we're in a post-apocalyptic world, but it's relatable and I love it. You can email me your thoughts, comments, opinions, and counter-arguments at daysgonepod at gmail.com. You can also find me moderating the Days Gone subreddit. Thanks for listening. Weaver out.